Welcome to the Sage Thought Leadership Podcast, transforming the way people think and work so their organizations can thrive. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. I'm Ed Kless, and with me today is Jason Parr. Jason is the president and CEO of Peisner Johnson, a state and local tax consulting firm. We are the sales tax people he says, and we help companies gain peace of mind when it comes to sales and use tax obligations. Jason has been with the firm for 25 years, starting out as a staff assistant in 1996. He grew the firm and has deep knowledge regarding the pitfalls and successes of dealing with state and local taxes. Welcome to the Sage Thought Leadership Podcast, Jason. Thanks, Park. Ed. It's great to be with you. Appreciate that. Well, first off, why do you do what you do, Jason? Good question. <laughs> you know, starting out, sometimes you just need a a job while you're in college. But, um, you know, one of the core principles at Pizer Johnson is this concept of we over me. Um, And you wouldn't always hear an accountant say that they do what they do to help other people, but that's exactly um, why we do what we do. Um, Sales and use taxes is something that I call a margin killer. And if you don't understand your responsibility and and, and don't uh, manage that, then um, potentially if you don't collect tax when you should have, the state may collect it out of your own pocket with penalty and interest, and that works directly against margins on taxable sales. And so well, we want to help companies thrive, uh, stay in business specifically, and um, manage their sales tax obligations and responsibilities with peace of mind and confidence in the steps that they take. And to that end, what are the, the three essential questions that every business needs to ask themselves with regard to sales tax? That's huge, Ed. You know, <clears throat> since 2018, the Wayfair case, um, it, the nexus shifted, right? It went from where you conduct your business, where your people and property and, and locations are to where your customers are located. So it's my guess that it's it's got to be more than 90% of companies in doing business in the U.S. probably need to be registered in more jurisdictions than they're currently registered in. And I know that's a pretty bold statement, but it's significant what what situations are out there. And so there's really three questions every seller should ask themselves. Number one, do I have nexus? And we can talk a lot about physical nexus versus economic nexus. But in the last three years, it's important to know, do I have nexus in a particular state? Number two would be, is what I sell taxable, right? Not everything you sell is taxable, but probably most of what you sell is taxable. Uh, We could go into a long discussion of what's taxable and what's not, but you need to know that answer. Um, And then the third would be, how do I sell my goods, right? With the advent of all this legislation for economic nexus is also legislation for marketplace facilitators. Um, Essentially, who has a responsibility to collect and remit tax on sales that you make? If those are fulfilled by a marketplace, it might be the marketplace. Um, If there's other channels and other ways that you sell on your own, then it may be you. And so those are the three questions that you must ask yourself. And not just sellers. We talk to CPAs, accountants, and bookkeepers. These are questions that their clients uh, they need to be able to help answer as well. And um, so w- what we do is we want to talk to everybody because we want to help everybody. Um, and so we have this, some, some may say that it's kind of a corny uh, named free consultation, but it's called a what's next call. And essentially the, the most common question we get is what do I do next? And um, it, it is a free consultation where we learn about you. You learn a little bit about us. And what's beautiful about it is it's not a sales call. At the end of that call, if you have gained greater peace of mind and confidence on next steps for you and your company, we're perfectly happy. If there's not something that we can do beyond that to help, we're also perfectly happy to to help you with services that we offer. And let's talk a little bit of potentially what's happened since Wayfair. I know I think when Wayfair was passed about, I don't know, maybe just a handful of states, eight to 10 had sales tax d- defined what it meant by w- what is going to be um, the requirements in terms of dollar amounts and thresholds, transactions. That has since expanded, I think, to 30 something states, if I'm not mistaken. Are they all st- seem to be consistently adopting that those same standards ar- around the dollar amounts and transaction volumes? They are, and, and that's a really good question because just as of this month, the uh, governor of the Show Me State just signed into legislation 
um, both economic nexus thresholds and marketplace facilitator legislation um, requiring the marketplaces to collect and remit. Missouri was the last holdout um, on that. So every state that imposes a sales tax now has new economic nexus standards. Other than the very large states, they're usually somewhere around 100,000 in sales, right? That's probably the vast majority. Um, and then some states still have a transactional volume, 100 transactions or 200 transactions. But most of the states that pass transactional volumes have actually done away with that. So there's just uh, maybe a couple handfuls of states that actually have an economic sales threshold and a um, transactional threshold. But 100,000, you know, if you're just looking at your own books and you're starting to approach 100,000 in total sales, um, in, in a given state, then it's something that you should definitely take a look at and let's have a chat. And one of the things I'm glad there seemed to be eliminating that transaction thing. Cause what I, one of the things <laughs> I think I never got a, a clear picture on is, well, what if I do one invoice with a hundred things on it <laughs> or a hundred invoices with one thing? Is there a difference between those? What's considered a transaction, a line item or an invoice? Yeah, typically it would be an invoice, right? And, but then you get into the weeds of legislation that's really unnecessary because it, it might be a hundred items on an invoice, but that invoice may only be a hundred bucks. The the real key in the in the number of transactions was you were capturing really small businesses with small dollar items unnecessarily, right? That's not who you're going for. The whole reason to have what they would call some threshold was to avoid requiring companies with small numbers of sales to have to register and have to go through the administrative hassle of, of being registered collecting tax when the tax dollars might be a few dollars a year, right? Yeah, quite interesting. I mean, it, I I know this probably eliminate a lot of your business, but it would be a whole heck of a lot easier if they just went back to where Nexus was where the seller is. I think that would make much There's more no sense. There's no doubt too. about it. Let, let me tell you this. I'm glad you said that because in today's world, every time the government gets involved to simplify the process, it becomes more complex. And I say that because exactly what you've said, now you have a responsibility to comply in 45 or more states and jurisdictions because of economic nexus. But now you've, that, that third question, now you've got to determine, do I have a responsibility to actually collect the tax? Um, now I need to know the taxability of my products in 40 states instead of five states. I, and, and I have to have a system and a process to, to manage that on a monthly basis. And so it's only become more complex. Do I have the responsibility? Am I supposed to be collecting? At what rate do I collect? On what do I collect? Um, and so someone who might be in 40 states because of their commerce, their business operations, because they have customers in 40 states and they cross those thresholds, they almost have to become an expert to be able to actually manage it in-house. Um, gratefully, there's great automation that helps you with accuracy on what to collect and what rate to collect. Um, what we run into and what we see is a lot of disparity in the process of preparing returns and remitting the taxes from automation and some rigid aspects all the way to the consultative approach, all the way up to uh, CPA firms and the big four processing returns on behalf of clients. And Jason, we have an exit question that we ask all of our guests, and that is, who is a hero of yours and why are they a hero? So I don't know who said this, but they said, never meet your hero because you'll be disappointed. <laughs> And so I have kind of uh, an unorthodox response to that. It's who came before you, who taught you what you know and what you're good at. Um, and, and I know this may sound a little bit cliche or cheesy, but it's, it's Jerry Peisner and Andy Johnson, our founding partners. They're individuals who started this firm 30 years ago next year. Um, and they worked together and, and built that out. And because I've been here for 25 years, I observed them, I worked hard, I learned a lot, and now I'm in a position of, of owning and running the firm. But it's, be, it, it's looking to those that have done well and, and know something valuable and then developing those attributes and following that. And so I would say it's anyone who has come before you that taught you something that you applied and it developed success in your own life. And lastly, Jason, how can somebody contact you? PJ.tax. All right. 
Jason Parr, President and CEO of Peisner Johnson. Thanks so much for being a guest on the Sage Thought Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Ed. Review and subscribe by searching your podcast player of choice for Sage Thought Leadership Podcast.